Hi, I'm Sarah Davis. I'm the Senior Bibliometrics Librarian at the NOAA Central Library. And I'm going to talk today about how we've incorporated bibliometrics into our collection development program. Um, I'm just going to start with a, a bit of background about our library and our program to give you some context and then talk about where we were with collection development before we started all this. Um, then I'll move on to our first phase where we used bibliometric data to influence our journal purchasing. And our second phase where we used data as part of rewriting our whole collection development policy. <coughs> Um, and finally, I'll wrap up with some steps that we're taking now and some future plans. So um, we're located on the Silver Spring campus of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. NOAA has about 20,000 employees nationwide, and there are around 20 libraries, give or take, that serve those locations. But approximately one quarter of staff is located in Silver Spring, and we are the largest library to serve the system. Um, we're also the only one that serves all of NOAA's offices. We like to say that NOAA's research spans from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the sun. So it's all environmental sciences, but there's a lot of things encompassed in that. Climate and weather, um, modeling and prediction, oceanography, fish diseases, fish farming, satellites, all sorts of things. So it is specific, but quite broad within that. And our collection and our services need to reflect that breadth. Our bibliometrics program started in 2012 when we were asked to start identifying NOAA authored publications. Those are numbers that were requested by the Department of Commerce, which we are under. And we've grown to incorporate funded publications and some other projects. We're currently four people, two of which are here today. Um, and we all spend some amount of our time doing bibliometrics, but it is not our full-time work. We do a lot of other services related to bibliometrics. Uh, we contribute to the NOAA Science Report annually and do various trainings and visualizations for reports and really anything anyone wants. So the core of our program is identifying and analyzing NOAA articles. We spend a lot of time on this it is a weekly process that goes on all year long. Um, we have a quite extensive web of science search string that we perform every week. We examine every single article that comes from that um, to verify that it is in fact NOAA authored or funded. And then we add local metadata that helps us use that later. All of these titles are stored in an EndNote library so that we can go back to that later. We don't have to redo the search every time we need to do anything. Um, we use it to produce regular quarterly and annual reports and products, but it's also the basis for most of our other projects. And we are always looking to do new things with it, which is where collection development came out of. So before we started this, we didn't really have collection development happening. Um, there had been no major changes in over a decade. We did have a policy, but it was very old and out of date um, and focused almost exclusively on print materials. The electronic items discussed were mostly CD-ROMs and videos, not a lot about electronic journals, PDFs. Since that time, NOAA has moved to almost all digital publishing. So. We didn't have any policy for how to handle that documented. Nothing had really changed. Um, with the exception of 2012, we had a major budget cut, and we canceled 156 journal titles um, based entirely on cost per use. So some titles like Marine Policy, which does seem mission critical to the agency that sets marine policy. Um, we're, we're out the door because they're very expensive. And, and that's really where we were in, in 2018. 
2016 and 17 were a really big time for our library. We made a lot of changes. We moved to a new office in NOAA. We got a new director. Um, and we got an institutional repository after many years of trying to put one together, which was not addressed in our um, collection development policy at all. We also had a new goal, to move towards being a mostly digital library, because that's what our users need. And to do that, we needed to update our collection development policy and our journal selection procedures. Um, the policy needed to be simplified and trimmed. It was well over 100 pages. Um, the new one with appendices is less than 30. Um, we needed to account for our large and extensively used photo library um, and the new institutional repository. And we wanted to incorporate data um, for strong decision making. So we started with just using the data that we had and the web of science tools that we use regularly to determine which journals NOAA authors were publishing in and which ones they were citing because this should give us a pretty good idea of what journals we should carry in our library. So that was our first step and it was pretty easy. It's um, really only a matter of a few minutes for us to pull up a list of our top journal titles and get counts for those because we've done the work over the years of making this bibliography. And then we were able to download all the data that said what articles were being cited. Um, unfortunately, that's where the easy part ended. When you download lists of references with cited references from Web Science, you get a very nice spreadsheet that has tidy little columns of data about your journal articles and one massive column that's just a jumble of um, cited references. It's a, it's a paragraph. It's difficult to work with, but we were able to use Excel and OpenRefine, which is a open source data wrangling tool and uh, has a bit of a steep learning curve with it uh, to clean all that data and get a list of journal titles and the number of times they were cited every year. And I don't think I mentioned, but we did this for the previous two fiscal years to give us a good picture of what was being currently used. We then took those two data points and combined them with some other data to create our matrix. We used ILL requests, cost per use, and usage statistics, um, and numbers from our patron survey. It was our very first patron journal survey. We asked people what titles were important to their work and what titles they'd like to see us collect. And then we put it in a nice color-coded, giant, sortable and filtered spreadsheet and sat down in a room and started making decisions. So the first year we did this, we canceled 29 titles that our data showed just weren't getting used. Nobody was downloading them, no one was citing them, no one was publishing in them. We didn't need to spend that money. And we used the savings from that to purchase 13 new titles, including several that were canceled in 2012, like our beloved marine policy. We did it again this year. Um, it was a much quicker, smoother process all around from the data collection and processing to evaluating them. And we didn't end up making any major new changes. There were a couple titles added, um, but mostly our data supported the decisions we made last year, which was very, it was, it was nice, it was a good feeling. <laughs> so our process isn't perfect. Our, our data for this looks at all of NOAA's publishing, but a lot of our purchasing is just for our Silver Spring campus. That is something that we're just gonna have to deal with. We can't parse out what items are just being used by Silver Spring employees. Um, we can't even always parse out where a certain office has employees doing research as opposed to policy. We have a lot of policy makers in our building. A lot of the researchers are in the field, but then there's a lot of researchers in our building. It's, 
it's something that we're not going to be able to know, at, certainly at this point, and we just have to sort of accept that, but also we do serve NOAA-wide and all of NOAA's science. So it is, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good process, but it is imperfect. Um, it also doesn't provide any data on our non-publishing offices. So we have an Office of Education. They don't publish, so they don't cite. We don't know what they're using, but they do need current research. And they're very small, so we only got a couple requests from them. But we were able to, because we know, um, we know these people, we were able to subscribe to some things that they are using. We saw that in our data this year. And that really points to the fact that this is a process about making data informed decisions as to just data driven. We also came up with a few new questions. Um, there were journals that were being cited hundreds of times that we don't subscribe to. So where are people getting them? And is this something we should be concerned about? Um, and we got a number of requests for journals that we did subscribe to, that people wanted us to get. Why don't they know we have them? How can we better inform people? There are some tech issues with just sending out mass emails to people on our campus. Most of them go network-wide. You don't want to advertise something to the whole network when only a quarter of it can actually access it. So that's something we're still working on. So from there, we moved on to the less immediate problem of rewriting our collection development policy and hopefully getting to some weeding. Um, we started with defining our current scope, so we'd have a good idea of what we have. Um, and then defining our ideal scope. And finally, combining those two things to set some parameters for weeding the collection and also very limited uh, patron-driven future acquisitions. We're not looking to increase very much, but we do want to have current information. Defining our current scope was relatively easy. We were able to pull reports from our ILS about what our cataloged holdings were. Um, we do have a number of uncataloged holdings, so we can't really assess those. And then look at the call numbers and subject areas that we have. There were a couple little surprises. You can't see it because it's so tiny, but there's um, several 7,000 M music items listed. M is not music. M is a completely separate collection. It's the M collection. It's a historic one that we inherited from another library. Um, it is within scope. It just doesn't look that way in this chart. And then we started um, defining our ideal scope. So what should we have? And we wanted to do this not based on just how we felt about what we should have, um, but what actually was being used. So we looked at 10 years of publication from NOAA, um, journal articles, as well as NOAA technical memoranda. The technical memoranda are peer-reviewed in-house publications. Um, they are high quality science that reflects NOAA's successes as well as some small failures. Um, it's just, it's really important to NOAA's research and it really reflects what NOAA is working on in the moment. We looked at the top categories. There's only five shown here, but we did the top, I think, 100 um, in both. But you can see there's two different schemas. Web of Science subject categories are rather different than Library of Congress subject headings. And there's a lot of overlap. Web of Science tends to be quite broad. Library of Congress tends to be hyper-specific. So we built a crosswalk between the two. I had a lot of help from our IR manager, um, and master cataloger, in figuring out subject headings because I myself am not a cataloger. And this turned out to be the hardest part of our process. Um, 
there's just a lot of different options that we played with, so we went back and forth on using different ways to compare the two. We tried using keywords from Web of Science to try to get more specific. There were too many, and, and they were used in too many different ways. The Library of Congress subject headings, there's main headings and subheadings. They're used differently and interchangeably sometimes. And uh, cataloging procedures over the years have changed a lot. There have been years where there might be three subject headings and other years where there might be 30. So it's not necessarily the best way to look at it. We ended up going with Web of Science subject headings and main Library of Congress subject headings as we use them, which was why it was so helpful to have a NOAA cataloger working on this. Um, so after we had that, we were able to use that to determine collection level um, for our collection. We classified things as out of scope, minimal, basic, and research. We don't go comprehensive on anything because that would include things like encyclopedias and textbooks, and we don't want to collect those. We'd already determined that in our collection policy. And then we get to the fun part. We get to weed. Um, our, our sort of loose goal at the moment is to trim about a third, which shouldn't really be a problem. Uh, I should also explain we lost a third of our physical space in 2013. We did not get rid of hardly any physical materials. Uh, they were shifted. Currently, our Library of Congress collection, which is only one of our monograph collections, is in two different portions of the library, about 200 yards apart, which is very confusing both to staff and patrons. Um, we've, for a while, had two things, two different floors, so stuff on our second floor and the ninth floor. It's just not a great way to organize your materials. And NOAA is physically downsizing in terms of office space. There are some field offices that are being folded into our location. We want to make room for that. And we also want to get rid of everything that is out of date and superfluous. We have um, German mathematical textbooks that are not they're not in our scope, they're not helpful to our users. It looks messy, it makes it hard to find things. And we wanna be current and reflective of what our users need. We have some other criteria, not just our scope. So if it's an internal publication, we will be keeping it. If it's a particularly unique item, whether or not we published it, we will likely keep it or find the most appropriate home, um, age, of the item and currentness, and then that's going to vary slightly between different subjects because science moves at different rates in different areas. Um, and also the language, we have a lot of non-English titles that do not get circulated, they do not get used. Um, so we're currently in a testing phase of this, looking at sections and drafting a hierarchy of weeding to make it easier to make those decisions and minimize arbitrary decisions. So somebody walks in the stacks and says, I don't like this title. We don't want that. We, we've had that before. Um, so we're doing that. We have already learned some lessons. We had TK, which is some kind of engineering, marked as out of scope. It turns out it is not out of scope. It is, it is minimal. There is very little that we should keep. Um, and in, but NOAA has published in that area. NOAA is still doing research in that area. They're just not currently publishing in that area. Um, so that is, that's our big lesson learned there, and we will continue to do that. But that testing has reinforced that eliminating a third it will be a pretty easy task without getting rid of things that we need. We do have some future plans. I would like to enhance the matrix. Um, there are other metrics that we could incorporate, such as our subject area, now that we have an idea of scope, um, as well as journal metrics, some way to decide which new titles we might want to subscribe to, uh, and enabling the weighting of metrics. So 
It's a little more automated and a little less six people in a room looking at a spreadsheet on a protector, sorting it, talking about it, Googling things. Um, that's been very helpful, but we could probably do it faster. I'd also like to do more with our 10-year publication analysis. We did notice some slight trends just on a cursory glance. So how can we identify emerging research areas? Um, we're working, I'm working on learning some topic modeling tools to see if we can use that. Just anything we can do to learn more from what we've already collected. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a research services librarian, but I sit between two of them and I am on the outreach team. So any way that I can help them use the data we've collected to provide better services um, in terms of matching resources to the offices that we work with and trying to identify some underserved patron groups. Our campus has almost 5,000 people. It is very hard for us to know what all those people are doing. And data is a really good way to find out. So we're hoping that that can help. And we've already made a lot of strides in reaching out to new groups and providing them with resources they didn't know about. Um, and then very personally, I'd like to streamline our process because it is, it is fairly labor intensive and there's a lot of data cleanup. Insights, uh, which is a web of science tool, does have a journal usage analysis option. Um, I forget what they're calling it. It's very, very quick, and it is meant to see very quickly what you're publishing in and what you're citing. However, it's a little less precise than our curated data set, and we can't parse things out by fiscal year. It's calendar year only. Um, and also playing around with R, but it might be more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> um, so, are there any questions? So the question, if no one heard it, was do we have the capability for an institutional affiliation search or do we run a whole list of authors? Um, Web of Science does have the organization enhanced, which is what we used for the 10-year publication um, review just to get a, a broad sweep. It's not as precise as ours. We have a very, very long search that we search in the affiliation field and also, um, w sorry, it's author address and funding text for variations of NOAA and a number of, well, every NOAA office we can think of. There are six line offices and several staff offices. Every line office has several labs and divisions, like many, many labs and divisions. So we, we run a very wide net search and then narrow it down manually because we're, we're looking for precision. Um, our, our main data set gets reported to the Department of Commerce as a, one of the metrics that, that NOAA's evaluated on, so we try to be very, very precise in our, our searching. But we use both features. Um, currently, we don't do an author search. We have for other projects, though. I am playing with topic modeling tools. <laughs> so I've been playing around with R and also with um, a tool called, it's Carrot. The Carrot search is the one that it, it's, it's larger. Um, and then we use for our bibliometric reporting a pair of tools, the Science of Science tool and Gephi, um, which can do network analysis. Um, Science of Science was developed at Indiana University and is specifically for bibliometric journal analysis. Gephi is just a network visualization and analysis tool. It, 
it's a little weirder <laughs> um, and less intuitive, but it does, it, it can produce some interesting results and you can look at sort of groups of topics. So sort of word co-occurrence. Um, I don't currently have access to Carrot Search, which is the sort of professional version of Carrot, which is a different, um, mostly open source, but not free product that um, does very complicated topic modeling. <laughs> um, but it's something that we're talking about with our NOAA R&D department, who we're also working on combining our our efforts with journal analysis with the NOAA R&D people who are looking at grants and projects um, and the IR, which has all the publishing. Yeah. All the NOAA publishing? All the NOAA publishing. Also, a, a small housekeeping note, we are a web of science shop. It's the tool we have. It's the tool we've used. It's worked out well for us, um, particularly at Clarivate. Clarivate's been very helpful, and those tools have evolved nicely, and they've done a lot of training. But this process is something that you can do with Scopus. Um, Dimensions has the same data. If you're really handy with APIs, you can probably do it with Scopus data without subscribing to anything. So. Don't ask me how, I just know that it's possible. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the question was, are research encour researchers encouraged to publish in open, open access? Some offices encourage it. Some grant programs require it. The library promotes publishing in open access because it means that you can make things publicly available. Um, these, the extra expense is often a deterrent for some of our offices um, because NOAA does pay for the publishing fees. So if you can't get your office to pay for it, you're less likely to publish in open access. Yes. So, Okay, the tool OpenRefine, it's an open access tool that I think was originally developed either by or in conjunction with Google. It is no longer. Um, it's, it looks kind of like Excel. You, you load in spreadsheets, CSVs, different data files, and then there's a number of tools you can use to clean up data. So it's really good if you're trying to work with um, work with messy data. It's a data wrangler. Um, you can also include code, so Python and R can be sort of plugged in there and you can write a whole, do a whole process with your data, which um, I'm working on doing that right for this particular process because there's some minor, minor tweaks. Foreign journals really confuse it. Um, so it's, it's a free download. Uh, there's also I think a, a free book online about how to use it, but a lot of t discussions on like GitHub about how to do various things. That's how we figured it out. <laughs> but it is very helpful. It is most of the time not like the whole process. It is a stage in your process. So we start in Excel, we go to OpenRefine to do a bunch of stuff, and we usually end up back in Excel or, um, or Gephi or some other tool. Very good. I was very quick. Is that you, Megan? Yes, I am. Is Maxine out there? She was in another session. Oh, she's 
Okay. Okay, great. I didn't know if she had. Um... Oh, okay, but she does have PowerPoint, so we'll just add her up. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Megan, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's Megan Kowalski, correct? Yes. Okay. Phew! What do you know? I know. I wish I kept my maiden name because my maiden name was Gates. <laughs> oh! Life would have been so much easier. That would have been interesting. M. Gates? Oh, and my middle name is Elizabeth, so Megan Elizabeth Gates. My initials were my nickname, and, and I got married and burned everything. Jeez. Right. I hope not. <laughs> no. It's <laughs> fine. Um, so uh, what have you two worked out? Anything? She's going to go first. We did slides separately because um, yeah. she didn't realize until about a week ago she was sharing this session. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we had talked yesterday, so we've got it worked out. She's going to do half. I'll do half and then we'll do time for questions. Right. Okay. Okay, great. I thought it was in the Potomac room, so I was like, oh, those columns are always in the way. Yeah. yeah. No. We lucked out. Yeah. We lucked out. We, it's a big cavernous room for the yeah. last session. We have the last session. Oh, yeah. I know, and I so I've been telling them all day. I don't know if you've been in here or not, mm -hmm. but yeah. the light on the last day. Well, I mean, I sit in the back because I'm like pregnant, so I'm getting in trouble. Oh, yes. Right now. Uh, yes. Yeah. I don't take offense to your here. No. <laughs> I know. I know. I just wish they'd move up here. I, I'll tell them that. It doesn't matter if they have to leave or not. You know what? Yeah. Or if they're not interested. That's fine. <laughs> But really, just give it a go. It's freezing, eh? Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, it comes and goes, actually. Because when I first walked in, I was going to say, yeah, it's Oh, I know. I know. I'm originally from upstate New York, and I'm just like, no, this is too bad. We went out for dinner in Arlington because um, I came down to stay with a good friend who's in Arlington, right? And um, her daughter joined us. Okay, it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit. For me, that's like five, right? And um, her daughter wore flip flops and a sleepless dress. Now, yeah. mind you, we just walked a block. However, but still, still. And the next morning, there were people sitting out. I'm sorry, it was only 55 degrees. They were sitting out in shorts and sleeveless tops, having their coffee. Really? 